Today is Good Friday. It is the day that we solemnly remember the passion of our Christ. The day that Jesus Christ took on sin and death and suffered and died to save us. During this special Good Friday service, we will share reflections from God's word and we have the pleasure of worshiping with Pivot Ministries. Before we begin, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus Christ to save us. We remember Christ's sacrifice, Christ's suffering, and Christ's love for us through the cross. We remember the enormity of your sacrifice and your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. The trial. Today's reading is from Mark 15, verses 1 through 15, which tells of Jesus' trial that was held early in the morning on the day of his death. This account is also found in Matthew 27, Luke 23, and John 18. Though each of the Gospels describes the tremendous weight that Pilate felt as the judge of Jesus' fate, they contain additional details on the trial, so I will blend together these four accounts. When the chief priests brought Jesus to Pilate, they did not bring him to be judged in his court. Instead, they approached Pilate after already having tried Jesus and declaring him guilty of being the king of the Jews. The priests embellished the charges against him, appealing to Pilate that he should take the case because Jesus was viewed by them as a national security threat. In Luke 23, 2, they proclaimed, We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ the King. Pilate's initial response was in John 18, verse 31, You take him and judge him according to your law. But the priests responded, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. The chief priests, elders, and scribes demanded that Pilate carry out the verdict and execute Jesus. Pilate had heard of Jesus' miracles, knew that the charges were false, and worse, understood their evil motive. Mark 15.10 says, He knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. Pilate tried his hardest to avoid making the most profound verdict in human history. Pilate first asked Jesus if he was the king of the Jews, and Jesus did not answer directly. In Mark 15, 2, Jesus replies, It is as you say. This response caused Pilate to marvel at his strength. Clearly, he expected defendants to argue a defense and plead for their lives. Pilate then told the priests he found no fault in Jesus. Luke 23, 6 tells us when the chief priest persisted and Pilate learned that Jesus was from Galilee, a light bulb went off. Galilee was Herod's jurisdiction, so he passed the buck and sent him to Herod. Unfortunately for Pilate, Herod found no fault in Jesus and sent him back to Pilate. In Matthew 27, verse 19, Pilate's wife warned her husband, saying, have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. This further complicated Pilate's dilemma. Pilate's next attempt to avoid Jesus' execution was the prisoner exchange. So he offered the priests the choice of releasing the known heinous murderer Barabbas or Jesus. By this time, the priests had already riled up the crowd and into a tumult and shouts of free Barabbas echoed through the courts. Pilate again pleaded with the priests and crowd asking what evil has this man done? Matthew says the only response was the crowd shouting for him to be crucified. How easily the crowd, who had no doubt heard of Jesus' miracles, been manipulated by the priests. Pilate feared the crowd. If he stood his ground and followed his conscience, 
avoiding judgment, he would lose his authority, possibly his job, and face riots and unrest. If he gave in to the crowd, he would forever have a, a guilty conscience. Pilate chose the path of least physical resistance, the path that would preserve his position as ruler. Wishing to satisfy the crowd, he released Barabbas, scourged Jesus, and delivered him to be crucified. However, Pilate made one last attempt to assuage his own guilt for sentencing an innocent man who only so recently had been loved by the people. In Matthew 27, verse 26, Pilate declares, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. He ceremonially washed his hands, proclaiming to the crowd and appealing to his own conscience that he was not responsible for the blood of Jesus. But did this work, or was he forever haunted by this event? Both the Apostles and Nicene Creed convict Pilate as the sole purpose at that moment in history responsible for crucifying our Lord. There is no mention of the chief priests or the angry crowd. The fate of Pilate is unclear. Some historians have written that he and his wife converted to Christianity, while others say that he later committed suicide. What is clear is that 2,000 years later, we often find ourselves in situations similar to Pilate's. These may not be as historically important, but they are just as morally important. As Christians, we are often faced with situations where we must choose between following Jesus or following the crowd. We try to follow Jesus, and sometimes we succeed, but other times we choose the easier path and give in to the crowd and temptation, and still other times we, like the disciples, remain silent. Pilate is a human, and one of the most pivotal moments in history failed. We all have failed. The difference between us and Pilate is that we know we do not have to wash his blood off our hands, for Jesus has already done that for us on the cross. Amen.
Imagine taking a successful, well-dressed Fairfield County man and an independent 21st century, well-educated Fairfield County woman, and you take them in the back of your car to meet your God. You take them to the outskirts of town, a part of town that they hadn't visited prior. You pull down an obscure, bumpy dirt road. At the end of the road emerges the town garbage dump. You and your passengers get out of the car. The area is littered with trash. The air smells of sulfur and smoke. You point to the top of the hill. It's on the top of the hill where three naked men hang by nails from crosses covered in blood because they have been beaten. Your God is not the one on the right or the left. Your God hangs in the center. There's your God. You notice that your passengers are turning pale. They're petrified by this barbaric sight, as are you. They have second thoughts about meeting your God. You inform them that your God is the one who hangs in the center. As you walk up the hill together, you hear the cries of women standing at a distance. They are weeping and wailing. You see authorities are at the scene of the crime, but they make no effort to stop the killing. Instead, they're preoccupied with dividing the clothes of your God. As you and your passengers inch your way closer 
to the men who are being crucified, you see the clergy. You expect them to be praying, but instead they are mocking your God. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah, the chosen one. Then a group of armed soldiers join the mocking choir. If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A third mocker joins them. This mocking comes from above. It's one of the criminals who hangs beside your God. He's scoffing, saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The man and woman who left the comfort and the distractions of their busy lives to meet your God begin to plead with you. If he is God, tell him to save himself. You say, I can't do it. They join the criminals, the clergy, and the soldiers, not mockingly, but unknowingly and compassionately urging your God to save himself. Jesus, save yourself. They see the sign above your God's head, King of the Jews. They say, King of the Jews, save yourself. You whisper, it's no use. My God refuses to save himself. He dies to save you. They say, to save who? Before you can answer, one of the crucified criminals yells to the other, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then the same criminal turned to your God saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Your passengers hear your God speak for the first time. He turns to the criminal, the one who was condemned justly, saying, truly I tell you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Now you turn again to your passengers. They're puzzled. You whisper it again. My God doesn't save himself. He dies to save you. He dies to save all of us, condemned justly to death for our sins. This is our God, the one who hangs from the tree refusing to save himself so that he could save all who believe. Just as the one condemned to death looked to Jesus in faith, today we look to our naked, bloody God hanging on a tree in faith and thank him for refusing to save himself so that we might be saved and be with him forever in paradise. Amen.